live. Welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners from around the world. Uh, today I'm joined by three top quality practitioners in their field. Uh, Ronnie Ibrahim is an assistant professor of biomechanics and kinesiology at the Qatar University. About Sebastiano Pochettino, former first team fitness coach at Tottenham Hotspur, and Matt Doyle, who's the current head of academy goalkeeping at Birmingham City. Uh, before I introduce you in full to the three guys today, um, let me uh, give you a bit more de few more details on today's discussion on analysing goalkeeper diving saves to optimise technical and strength and conditioning training methods. Ah, so as you can see here from the screen, um, this will be the, the format for today's discussion. Um, as always, we'll try and make it a, a discussion of two halves. Um, first half, we'll sort of look at the, the guys training and research methods. So we'll do that through a series of presentations from Ronnie, Sebastiano, Sebastiano and Matt. Um, and then we'll sort of look more at that at Ronnie's research, um, um, the methods of the research, a little bit into the findings, which will then bring us into the second half, where we'll look at applying those findings to, to the training ground. Um, and first of all, we'll sort of look at how that research could be adopted by the coaches, how researchers get that buy-in from coaches, which is never, never easy. Um, and then to look at once it's been adopted, how it is assimilated into training sessions, how you monitor those new methods to see if they're actually successful. Um, so to ask questions on, on these topics, um, there's a QA and a tab at the bottom of your screens, uh, if you use that, and we'll filter as many of your questions into the discussion as we can. So if in the first half of the show you sort of focus on on the sort of research side and research methods and then on the second half of the show you start filtering in your questions around the application training methods and we'll get through as many of those as we can um, so that we can do that let me start introducing you to today's guests um, so I'll begin with uh, Matt Doyle uh, Matt is the Head of Academy Goalkeeper Coaching at Birmingham City. Uh, how are you, Matt? It's good to have you with us today. Yeah, appreciate the invite. Uh, second time on, so um, hopefully I've done all right the first time. But no, I'm, I'm great. Uh, apologies to anyone that is watching. My internet seems to be a little bit unstable, so hopefully um, I'm, I'm staying for the long run. But um, if I get chucked out, I'll get straight back in. But we should be all right. But no, I appreciate the invite. Um, yeah, I just want to put a, for the people out there, Matt, you just sort of tell them, tell us a little bit about your your football journey um, in terms of coaching and, and sort of leading up to the your current position at Birmingham City. Yeah, sure. Uh, so <clears throat> currently I'm 31. So I've been, um, I suppose I've been working full time in this industry since, since I was about 18, really. So um, that took me from uh, a club in League Two called Barnet. Uh, then on to Stoke City, uh, sort of a similar role to what I'm doing now for sort of four years in. So, yeah, Barnet for four years, uh, Stoke for about four years. Uh, and then I I went abroad, which was brilliant, to Malaysia for, for a season in their, in their uh, Super League, uh, which was a great experience in 2016-17. In um, and then I actually went back to Barnet for a, for a stint after I came back from Malaysia as a head of goalkeeping sort of role, uh, which was like first team uh, working well, obviously in the whole spectrum, really. Um, and then the the Birmingham City opportunity came up in um, well 2018. So I've been there nearly three years. So when we get to January, I'll be there three years. So um, yeah, I've, I've had a, a nice mix both here and abroad and working across various ages, really. So that's a real brief uh, tour around my background. So hopefully that's clear for everyone. All right, brilliant. Thanks, Matt. Um... Alongside Matt, we have uh, Sebastiano Pochettino. It's uh, great to have you with us this morning, Sebastiano. Well, thank you very much, Steve. And uh, good morning or, or good afternoon to everyone, depending on which part of the world you're at at the moment. And uh, well, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Steve. 
No, it's a pleasure to have you there. Like, as you mentioned, yeah, we've uh, sort of an audience from all seems to be all, all corners of the globe. Uh, sort of just been sort of welcoming guests from Canada, from India, Middle East, UK, Europe. So yeah, it's a, a real wide mix of attendees today. Um, yeah, I just wanted, yeah, if you could just quickly share a little bit of your your footballing journey and, and to where you are now. Obviously, I understand that with part of the, the coaching staff at, at Tottenham under under Maurizio, Maurizio Pochettino that you're sort of waiting for your next opportunity, but sort of, yeah, everything has sort of led up to where you are now. Well, uh, we can maybe start from uh, the point where I did my BSc. I studied in Southampton Solent University here in the south of England. And uh, it was a very good course, applied sports science, uh, lots of good lectures in there, lots of good content, many opportunities to start to get the experience. And when I finished my BSc, I started my journey at Tottenham Hotspur, uh, joined in the first team. Uh, my role changed slightly from the beginning to the end, uh, going through more applying science and doing sports science research within the, within the club. But equally also developing as a fitness coach, uh, taking even more responsibilities through the years working with the players closely, designing drills, implementing them on the field and on the gym both. So uh, I took on board uh, the roles there at Spurs during three and a half seasons up until last November. And equally, uh, I also studied uh, my master's in the University of Evry Valdezon in Paris, um, alongside with uh, two really good practitioners and uh, having been imposed by my mentor in France who taught me a few uh, chemical uh, techniques to understand and analyze uh, saliva markers such as testosterone, cortisol, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So um, there's been a mix to my education, I think, and my experience, uh, both being on the gym, on the field, within a football club, but equally also applying a little bit of research and uh, having the ability to study both in the UK and in France uh, opens up a little bit my, my perspective on different ways to look at the sports science as well. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, we're going to be looking a lot of that, that sort of mix of academia and sort of the practical side on the training ground and how we bring those two together, which kind of leads me on perfectly then to Ronnie Ibrahim, who is our academic for, for today. Uh, Ronnie's an assistant professor of biomechanics and kinesiology at Qatar University. Uh, Ronnie, I think uh, you've already been hard at work today, I believe. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, you know, actually, Sunday is a, is a working day. So, yeah, now, now it's almost at the end, at the end of the day here, at the end of the working day. First of all, I would like to say hi, Steve, hi, Sebastian and Matt, and uh, would like also to greet the, the, the attendees from all over the world. And would like to thank you for the invite as, as well. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and to also tap on one of the weaknesses and needs in terms of research and practical words, whether in football or in, in other uh, sports, sports disciplines, which is bridging the gap between the, the academic research and the practical implications and the practices. So uh, yeah, and that's, and, that's, and that's a good example here while we're having experts from uh, multiple, uh, um, in a, uh, from multiple areas, from, in, from academic research and from uh, sports science practice and from coaching department. So um, yeah, um, regarding my journey to here, uh, basically it started when um, with an interest in football and then uh, with an interest to also deepen my knowledge in terms of sports science to uh, really try to make an impact from this uh, side. And also why goal, 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 goalkeepers? And everyone asked me this question. And it was so simple because it was so, so clear that especially strength and conditioning coaches and uh, talent identification teams were treating uh, goal, goalkeepers um, uh, like like uh, field field players with no with no uh, clear uh, differences. Maybe the only the only difference was the morphology of, of, of the players that goal goalkeepers need to be taller. Um, and however, so so and uh, and it was clear that lots of uh, lots of opportunities are there. And uh, yeah, and that's and that's where. Um, I did my master's in biomechanics and did my PhD and, and in my PhD I mainly uh, focused on goal, goalkeeper's diving save it was between the Free University of Amsterdam and, and the Ajax 
And um, yeah, and th th here I am at Qatar University uh, now and uh, trying, trying to keep moving forward in terms of this field. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, we'll certainly hear a lot more about your, your research into goalkeepers, the goalkeeping save in a moment. But I think first of all, I'll sort of uh, hand over the screen to, to Matt Doyle. Like I say, we'll uh, then focus on, uh, on Matt's methods as a, as a goalkeeping coach, that technical side, how, how, how he sort of deals with that on the grass with, with young, young goalkeepers. So uh, Matt, uh, if you're ready, the screen yeah. is, is all yours. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. What I will say is before, so I've, had, I've got some um, some footage of some some games. Not so not not any training footage of of, um, of the work I've done at Birmingham. Purely just one to um, I felt I thought it would be great to to raise it to to the people on the chat and, and get some feedback and and get opinions on it because I'm far from an expert. Um, I think just to make clear before I do show what I show um, and, and I think Ronnie made a great point in, in terms of how goalkeepers should be trained and are they trained just you know uh, generically like the the outfielders I think we've got to appreciate that that every goalkeeper is different as well and that's something that I try and consider all the time when whenever I'm you know that's if I'm speaking to to the coaches at the club or whether it's through talent ID or whether that's through just working with your goalkeepers um, what might work for one might not work for for another um, and I appreciate everyone's most probably got different opinions as well. Um, so I've got a few videos of some um, some recent footage. I think it's majority uh, from the Premier League, actually. So um, just just different diving saves. And it'll be great to just open it up to the floor. Hopefully some questions come in. Um, and hopefully both Ronnie and Sebastiano will, will be able to um, to chip in with their, with their vast amount of knowledge as well. So hopefully these um, videos work. Let's give it a go. So we'll go... I, I, um, I guess you can see that, Steve. Is that correct? We're all yes. good? Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Brilliant. So, like I said, I'm very much, I suppose, about for about the last year, I've been actively really interested in this side of it. Um, again, linked into to knowing that, you know, not every goalkeeper is going to do a certain thing the same way. This might be due to their, um, it could be their physical uh, makeup. It could be their, could be just a habit of the way they've worked it could be you know something that I'm really interested in, in in is perception and action coupling so what are we perceiving from the environment to make us do these actions um, so is it something that can it be taught or is it just setting up realistic um, scenarios in training so that the goalkeepers are always getting realistic cues and triggers and then they're getting their timing so I'll give you an example of uh, so this isn't something that the term that I've come up with, and, and please jump in if, if anyone um, objects. So call it a double tap. So if anyone's familiar with tennis as well, um, they, they use something called a split step. So it's before I play the video, I'll give you a bit of context. It's it's them being slightly in the air still as, as the ball, whichever ball you might be talking about is hit. So then it allows the athlete um, to be slightly in the air um, and then almost land one foot. Uh, before the other and obviously the first foot will dictate as to where they sort of want to move so this video gives you a little bit of context about it and I, I call it a double tap uh, and there is a research paper which I'll show after which sort of backs um, this up a little bit so hopefully this plays it's about just under two minutes long as you can see So it's slowed down on. So as you can see, he's, he's planting his right foot there and then he's planting his left in like a real quick, happily admit it. When I was younger, I used to always say, you know, try and get set as the ball's being hit. But, but you know, the, the older I get, surely you want to still be in the air slightly as the ball's on its way. So then your perception can pick it up and then you can act accordingly. So as you can see, these guys are, are doing what I'd call a double tap. Um, so they're still landing and as their perception, as they're, they're picking up the, the cues and the triggers, they're landing one foot um, and then they're planting onto the, to the near foot. So obviously the, um, there's about a minute left. I'll let you uh, have a listen and have a watch. So again, as I said at the start, far from an expert, um, the, the research paper that I sort of got, got me thinking with this aspect really was the, um, was just talking about the ball side leg and then the contralateral side. So the, you know, the, the research suggests that the, the optimum 
the higher balls power comes from planting the the um, contralateral side leg before the ball side leg. Um, whereas I was always, you know, just just push off through your near foot. But this sort of ties in. So as you can see, this Shemichael one there was was one that I'd really. So if I just pause this. So now from me, if we talk about perception, action, coupling, and, and if we go back to the point I made about making sure our environment, you know, there's this, you know, there's there's a lot of talk about do we do volleys in training and, and what what does it happen in a game, which hopefully some people can um, can understand uh, on the chat. So for me, this, so if I'm thinking about, if I'm getting in sort of, Kasper Schmeichel's eyes here. I'm seeing the two bodies in his eyesight there. So as you can see, my mouse cursor there, hopefully. And, and hopefully, you know, I'm guessing his subconscious mind is picking up one, I believe it's Neves, his body shape. And then obviously you've got the traffic in front of him. So for me, he's, he's almost, if you look at him now, he's in the air still slightly now. And now he's just planting his right foot because he's sort of anticipated. And, I, and I'd use it, the word anticipated, it's not an over-anticipation, so it's not guess, it's an anticipation. And then obviously he's bringing his uh, left foot in to then push and dive up. So that video just summarizes sort of a, a double tap. Um, so, I mean, has anyone got any thoughts on that to start with before I move on to another video? Um, I think, yeah, I think it's easier just to flow through and then- Flow through, yeah? Yeah, we'll bring everyone together whilst no we're through the presentation. So when, again, when I'm looking through these sort of scenarios and, and we all watch football, we all watch, um, you know, footage of stuff and, and I'm always thinking, I don't know whether that's a good thing or not, but I'm always thinking. So there's some recent footage now of Ramsdale. So, and again, what I will, you know, please, please let me state this. I'm not saying one way's right, one way's uh, wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm merely just observing things in it and, uh, and I'm really trying to understand what's going on. So this is a, a few examples of Ramsdale. Having a similar, um, so he's, he's in the air slightly, so he, but he brings the, uh, the ball side leg inwards to then push. So for me, and again, I'm hoping that someone can provide me with a bit more context because I'm still learning. From what I can gather and from what I'm always seeing is the further they need to maybe jump or reach, that leg does come in. So I think some, some people maybe get it right, some people maybe, maybe get it wrong. So when do they plant that? How far does it come in? Um, and there is an example, so to back that sort of open-ended question up, um, there was a recent footage of uh, Nick Pope. So again, if you think about the different throw them out. So if you look at, uh, well, we'll go on to Loris. So again, if you talk about different makeups, now I'd always see uh, Loris and Sebastiano might be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, someone that's, I think he, he relies on a lot more reaction time than maybe others. So I've always seen him relatively deeper in his goal because I think his, his foot speed um, is, is quick. So I think, again, that's what works for him. Now, I appreciate these, this footage that I will show you. The shots have come from a good distance. So naturally, I think you're going to have more time to move your feet. Uh, the last one is a bit closer, but it'll be interested again to see what people think. So you can just see Loris opting for sort of a, a step and a step and then a dive. Um, again, it's, it's from a distance. So you'd expect that he's not just going to push from there. The, the last one is slightly different. So this one is a little bit closer than the previous one, but it's still quite far. But as you can see, for me, Loris has always been more so towards his line. And I've seen various saves over the years sort of really utilize his feet across his line uh, for his reaction time. So I'm, I suppose what I'm trying to do with these videos, uh, everyone, is just, just throw out different examples, really. And this is the, the last one that I'll show. So this is maybe what I'd call a sweep. So as you saw with the ball side step, and I really hope I'm getting that term right, uh, the step coming in and planted, there's a time and a place where you simply can't plant it and you've just got to get that leg out of the way and sweep it and drop down. So these are, I think there's two examples of, again, recent footage. This is Patricio the other night. Just as you can clearly see, I'm just whipping that foot, whichever term you want to use, whipping it out of the way. And obviously his body weight is, is, is trying to get him down to the ground. Uh, with gravity so this is maybe used what for the closer stuff i'd say so again i, I think the reason I'm, I'm really interested in this stuff this is arguably where did he get it wrong did he get it right if he pulled it in and planted it would he have got a, a, a better leverage to push up to that 
ball here. As you can see, there's some great angles, and this is why I did use this footage because um, the camera angles really help sort of allow you to understand what we're looking at. So again, just to provide a bit of context. So, so yeah, so that, that's pretty much it. So for me, I just think it's really interesting because, um, you know, what works for one might not work for another. Um, I think the reason I'm really interested in this is because I feel like coaches, as, as coaches, I think we need to understand the context. So I'm not one to really prescribe a certain way. I think it's my job as a coach to, the skill of the coach to have, I suppose the knowledge um, and the, the the understanding of different concepts, uh, and obviously, hopefully, that will be backed up by some research, which I think where Ronnie and Sebastiano will have a, a better understanding, and clearly are doing a great job um, to to for me to ultimately be able to provide guidance for the goalkeeper. So I don't think it's for me to say, you know, your hand should be here. I appreciate we're digressing a little bit from a dive, but if we talk about an initial set. Um, you know, what works for, for example, I've got an under 16 goalkeeper, I won't name his name, who is very good at doing a certain thing. Uh, so a hop, quite a swing with his arms, uh, quite a narrow sort of set. And it, and it is really effective. Uh, and then we've got another one who's maybe a bit taller, a bit, a bit wider with his set. And he struggles a little bit with, with that little double, double, uh, double tap. Uh, can we work on it? I'll be interested to know. So Hopefully that provides a little bit of a, a background as to, to some thoughts I've got. And like I said at the start, I'm, I'm not trying to prescribe far from an expert. There's just some footage that have caught my eye recently and it'd be interesting to see what people think. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Matt. There's some uh, yeah, great examples there, which I think certainly leads up nicely into Ronnie's, uh, Ronnie's research, which will we'll make clear uh, what is the, uh, the contralateral and the ipsilateral. Um, but before we get to that, I sort of, uh, I think we'll sort of hand the screen, screen over to Sebastiano and we'll sort of get a, a strength and conditioning look uh, at, at the goalkeeping save in terms of yeah, the areas that, that, that Sebastiano was, was looking at this with his work while at Tottenham. Perfect. So I'll move on to share my screen. Hopefully we can all see this, uh, this presentation. Is it on screen, Steve? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So from now, uh, what I'm basically going to present to you is uh, a little bit of my experience as a fitness coach and uh, how I've implemented a physical development program for the goalkeepers alongside with the coaching staff and everyone else at Tottenham Hotspur throughout uh, three and a half seasons. And uh, today, more specifically, we're going to be looking at uh, what concepts or what aspects of this uh, physical development program uh, link up to the performance of the times for the goalkeepers. So I think that it is fundamental for myself to ask uh, a few questions before I start looking at the dives. And uh, the first one would be to define what are the fundamental game-specific actions of a goalkeeper. And uh, in my opinion, I think that regardless of the style of play or the tactics involved, there is one common denominator, and is that the goalkeepers need to stop goal-scoring opportunities from the opposition. And to do so, they utilize the dives to reach out for those balls that can go into the corners of the goal. Um, so basically, I've defined this as one of the most game-deciding actions that I would perform throughout a game. And later on, I go into the second question, which is what are the loads that they're expected to carry out from a fitness coach or a sports scientist perspective? I want to understand how many of these dives will occur throughout a game. I also want to know what intensity do these uh, are performed. And equally also, if we want to break it down into segments of time, how frequently, how densely this can occur simultaneously or, or um, linked up one after the other. Last, I think that it is important to also anticipate the challenges that they will face throughout the season. And this obviously includes potential injury risks that they might go through uh, from a generic point of view for the goalkeeper precision, but also from an individual standpoint, understand which are the needs from that injury per, uh, prevention perspective. And equally start to think about how do they adapt or cope with the competition? How do they uh, absorb all the training stimuli? And how they will cope with the accumulation of fatigue and emotional stress throughout the whole year. Having done this, I think that for all fitness coaches, it's important to, to screen the physical capabilities of the players. I think in the figure on the right, we've got a little overview from the inside bubble, showing the physical capabilities that are necessary to play football in any position. 
So goalkeepers, of course, they need to run and sprint, they need to change direction, or throw the ball with their hands or kick it still like any other position. But I could think if we, <clears throat> if we start looking specifically at the dive, I think it's a very technical and uh, well-oriented type of jump, it's a plyometric motion, which the goalkeepers project their body in terms to reach for that ball and be able to, to save it and, and keep the ball out of danger. In order to understand their capacity to dive, then we can break it down into different aspects and utilize different areas of science and, and uh, uh, start to understand the, the dive from different perspectives. Of course, we can, as we see in the list of the in the left, we can look at the clinical tests from the medical staff, understand the chronic injuries and, and limitations to the movement. But later on, we start to, um, to add more technologies and understand the range of movement, the key joints, uh, how quickly they can interpret or react to game situations, the strength and power not only in specific muscle groups, but then through whole mov movements and motions that are similar to the performance of a dive. And in this sense, it is important as well to, to try to break down and look at the jumping ability and the different components from concentric, eccentric phases, the landings, etc., to understand <clears throat> the capacities of, uh, of their ability to jump and how this can have a transference into the performance of a dive. A little bit of water to clear the throat. So basically, in order to develop these physical capabilities, I think the first responsibility is to facilitate their ability to dive because this is what goalkeepers have learned from an early age. And they are the experts at diving. Of course, through goalkeeping coaching and through uh, sports science and strength and conditioning, we can optimize and improve the performance. But equally, we need to allow them to be able to dive in the way that they've learned since they're young. I think one of the first points is to allow for that necessary range of movement in the key joints. And uh, as we've seen before, of course, it's important to keep good mobility and stability at the ankles, at the hips. But equally, in, in difference to all the other positions on the field, there's a larger uh, importance to that uh, thoracic mobility, being able to rotate, to extend, and equally to laterally flex. So alongside with the shoulder complex, they can reach to those balls that are far from their reach and be able to keep the ball out of danger. I think that we can achieve this through several structural musculoskeletal adaptations uh, through training and uh, uh, through strength and conditioning in order to improve the length of the fascicles in the muscles to uh, make stiffer tendons for better jumping. Uh, but equally, all we need to do is just to increase that intra and intermuscular coordination. Uh, first of all, trying to work on the specific joints and specific muscle groups, and then later on progress, as I say below, into, into uh, uh, training the movements rather than the muscles, no? Because I think that the biggest way to optimize the performance is, is to focus on motor control. Uh, and it is something that should be uh, low energy demanding and shouldn't, shouldn't carry over uh, an injury risk as we train through uh, the motor controller, uh, control learning. <clears throat> and I think that uh, it is a good opportunity for us fitness coaches to focus on this because we can start through isolating the muscle groups and trying to compensate or or look at those weaknesses. <coughs> but later on, we really want to progress to create more integrative drills that are more similar to the actual performance of the dive on the field. So basically, we want to actually work through those movements rather than through those muscle groups. That is the whole philosophy of, of our interpretation of a physical development program. I think that later on as well, it's important to uh, increase the challenge through uh, trying to achieve that speed of execution because the dives are preceded by a reaction and interpretation of a game situation. And it is fundamental to execute the dive as fast as possible. So we really want to focus on that speed of execution rather than increasing the resistance to, through, excuse me, rather than increasing the challenge or the resistance through external loads that create slower movements. If I look specifically at optimizing the dives, I think that one of the things that I need to focus on is to adhere to those biomechanical um, characteristics of the dive. So we want to train them in an action specific way. Of course, we start to look at, uh, similarly to what Matt was explaining before, they have a bilateral stance in this position, but equally we know that they don't push off through both legs at the same time. So we can take that factor as well to start to create drills in the gym that emulate the situation in which we push differently. We can do that basically through coaching through cues, we can also start to uh, 
uh, integrate uh, asymmetrical loading, so don't load both sides similarly. We can change the vector and we can uh, change the anchor from which the resistance is, and this is very useful, particularly when we utilize uh, resistance bands, uh, bungees, and later on we can use uh, pulley systems, isonential equipment, which allow us to create anchors uh, for the vectors to uh, be able to guide and channelize uh, the force production towards the direction that we want to, in a similar fashion to, to what the types happen. Equally, as the exercises and the drills start to get more comfortable, we can include different perturbations uh, and variability, not only within the drills, uh, but within each repetition. So we can make sure that every repetition becomes different. There is maybe some challenge or some obstacle that makes it more difficult to uh, sustain the same type of performance between the same repetition of a drill. And finally, the last step before integrating already into the, the competitive action of the dive would be to increase those cognitive demands. And we can start doing this through a simple reaction. So there is a preconceived uh, movement that will happen, they know in which direction they need to move, uh, but only a stimulus is presented to them and then they react towards it. Equally, if we want to increase that challenge, we, we include interpretations which means that uh, the, the action could go into any direction and the stimulus will not only bring the information of when to do it, but where to as well. So that obviously increases the cognitive demands, even if the movement itself is the same as we were using before. And finally, as a last slide, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about that holistic approach to the dive, because uh, if we keep it in isolation, it is a little bit easier to understand how the dive is performed and how to train it all through the segments and then through a movement on its own. But I think that one of the um, biggest opportunities that we have as fitness coaches is that we can improve their predisposition to dive successfully. As there are several other aspects that happen and uh, other actions that precede the actual action of saving. So I think in order to do that, we can start to work on that motor control learning and, and automatize those key multidirectional patterns, movement patterns that they produce before they actually do a dive. One well, of the first concepts that I talk about is keeping that 180 degree vision because they need to be worried about what happens in front of them and not behind them where the goal is. And equally, they need to have a linear focus that draws that line between the goal where they need to be standing and the ball, the position of the ball. So they'll always be um, positioning themselves on the field of play according to those two objects. I think that then right before the, the dive happens, and like Matt was explaining and showing in some of the videos, we can see that the goalkeeper changes his body posture and goes into more of an athletic stance. And in this situation, they give themselves the ability to, to charge, to load their muscles, to activate, and they're in a good predisposition to then react accordingly to wherever the side of the ball is going. I think that this charge mostly leads into a shot when we can interpret that a shot opportunity can happen, but many times the shot doesn't happen. So in this situation, we want to look at, okay, where is the position of the goalkeeper? Can we gain a little bit of space, like he was showing from, from the example of Hugo, that he said um, that he usually stays quiet on the line. That is something that has been coached to make sure that he can have as much time as possible to interpret the flight of the ball, to give himself a good opportunity to, to move with his feet and, and to gain that little bit of time that then translates into that little bit of distance between the hand and the ball that can make a difference. Mostly when this charge happens and the ball is changing or the game situation uh, avoids the shots and a goal scoring opportunity, we start to teach, okay, you can keep that charge, but then you need to adjust laterally to the position of the ball. So we start to coach. You can do a very small sidestep where uh, you're just sliding basically both feet, but keeping a really good contact on the ground. So if the shot happens at any time, it's basically like a charge, like a charging position, but just in a moving uh, sequence. But equally, let's uh, imagine a second example where the ball can be on one side of the box and it gets uh, passed to all the other side of the box. A shot could happen before, and then the ball position changes drastically. The goalkeeper is perhaps uh, on one side, uh, let's say on the right post, and he needs to move quickly to cover on that left post, which is the closest to the ball now. We will then coach to do that crossover step to cover that area as fast as possible, and then turning the body in order to create that charge in the position where the ball is in a potential second goal scoring opportunity. But equally, we also need to know this dive is not a dive from the center of the goal, it's a dive from a side of the goal. And we know that we're coming from the right to the left, so we're leaving more space on our right side. So sometimes we need to work against that inertia, against that momentum, going from right to left and thinking that the shot can happen to our right side. So there are several things that we can take into consideration before we actually produce the, the movement of a dive. Of course, there are other tactical um, aspects such as uh, many times we've been seeing in the videos uh, 
the safe happens after moving backwards, the safes happen after moving forwards, the safes don't only happen laterally, they happen at an angle, slightly forward, slightly backwards as well, so there are different angles at which we can push. And uh, of course, there are other aspects that happen around or after, immediately after the, the action of a safe, because uh, of course, from an injury prevention perspective, we also need to think about the absorption of the impact as, as the floor is quite tough and goalkeepers are, are accustomed to this impact, but equally, we still need to protect all the spine from the cervical area all the way down to the lumbar spine. And equally, what happens if there is a second action from that shot? As in many times we saw with the Rui Patricio uh, situation, of course, it didn't have much time. But equally, we need to think, okay, if the shot uh, isn't blocked or isn't out of danger, what happens if the second action can happen? We need to also work on the goalkeepers to reincorporate back into their feet and be able to um, react for a second action, a second shot on target. And this was just a little uh, overview of how we implement a physical development program. So thank you for this. Wonderful. Thank you, Sebastian. Oh, yeah, for uh, something so little, you certainly packed a lot into, into, those, uh, into those five slides. So yeah, some great, great stuff there, which obviously then we'll take from that and really channel into the research, which uh, Ronnie is about to share with us. Uh, so I'll sort of hand over the screen to Ronnie Ibrahim and, and sort of tell us a bit about the, the kind of three pieces of, of research into the goalkeeper diving, say, that you were involved with at Ajax. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Matt and Sebastiano, for the nice presentations. All right, let us... <clears throat> okay, hopefully you can see uh, the... Can you see my screen well? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, perfect. So um, let's start. Uh, I'll try. I'll try to keep it as simple as possible and as quick as possible because uh, we're going to see uh, practical results. So not only not only fundamental results, but also practical results and uh, research uh, from three different experiments. So uh, yeah, it can get messy. I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible and try to explain the methods in each experiment. So uh, we kind of can link uh, the method to the result to the conclusion. Um, okay, so let me first um, focus on um, saying or splitting the positions or the, uh, the, the performance of the skill, which it can be performed in a set play like penalty, free kick, and uh, like these kind of plays. And it can be also performed in open plays. Now, usually in biomechanics, if we want to understand a complex skill, because it's a skill also performed, it's a, an open skill, it's not a closed skill. And in order to understand it, we need to, we need to isolate it. And uh, my, my, my research was the, the first kind of research uh, in aiming to understand this. And uh, we really wanted to isolate it and then to start moving one step at a time uh, and eventually and ultimately reach the point where we understand also what's happening in open place and how we can optimize the performance in open place. So um, let's start. So, I'm, I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be presenting and explaining the results of these three uh, published research, and we're gonna start with the first one. Uh, before starting, the the common the common experimental setup of the three research is that in the three research we used an optoelectronic system, and this optoelectronic system are basically infrared cameras and 10 of them, uh, and basically they can detect the position of these uh, uh, bright markers that we are seeing on the body of the golden keepers. Uh, yeah, and then we can reconstruct the model, which we will see in the next slide. And we also used uh, two force platforms, one in under each leg to capture the forces of each, of, of each leg and be able to differentiate between them and the contribution to the performance. And we also used two high-speed cameras to try to uh, overlay the 3D model on the real footage and try to understand further the movement. Now, this is the shared experimental setup between the three studies. So 
this is always there. Now, what is specific for the first um, study? We had 10 elite goal keepers, um, and the goalkeepers were performing their preferred te technique. We didn't, we didn't intervene with their technique. We didn't impose any, any kind of changes. Uh, and uh, they had hanging balls in front of the goal in order to simulate more a realistic dive. So not pure lateral movement, but it was one, one meter in front of the goal. And we had also two, two heights, so high balls, 190 centimeters from the mattress and low balls uh, at 30 centimeters centimeter at both sides. So basically the goalkeeper cannot predict and cannot anticipate the height or the side of the goal. We had the light board in front of the, and you can see it basically here. So that was the light board. And basically this light board was at the, the penalty spot and uh, in a light will turn on uh, indicating the height and side of the ball that should be safe. So we had four lights, right high, right low, left high, left low. So uh, basically, uh, before starting any, any measurement, we, we kind of reconstruct this uh, uh, 3D, uh, 3D model that from, from there we can, uh, we can actually calculate a bunch of stuff and understand what is actually happening with precision and not only if and analyzing uh, uh, footage like uh, high-speed cameras and stuff like this, because that's that's also a bit advanced when we want to understand the movement. So 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 we so we want to take it back to a really precise measurement, and then we kind of um, move one step at a time. So and then and then that's that's what what, what we are seeing here is a goalkeeper uh, in the study is one trial performing a preferred safe to the left high ball. And of course the ball was uh, attached to the string with a magnet. So the, goal, the goalkeeper was, was, was free to uh, hit the ball or catch the ball. Like uh, we, didn't, we didn't also intervene with how they are saving the ball. So we uh, just let them do it. Um, and, and, and we are seeing also the uh, slow motion video from the high speed camera. And we're seeing also the 3D, 3D model. So what did, what did we found? We found that the goalkeeper, they preferred to start with a stance with at 33%. So of course we, we asked the goalkeeper, the light will turn on. And once the light will turn on, just dive as fast as possible. We wanted to see this quick, quick uh, movement and how they will set themselves. So a 33% to 40% uh, stance width, and we also normalize this to leg length to be able to compare it across uh, subject. So it was actually around 33% leg length. Knee flexion angle was around 62 degrees, and hip flexion angle was similar, around 63 degrees. So that was the optimal uh, preferred starting 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 position across the subject. And basically, the variation between them was very low, like indicating that. That was the preferred, but at the same time, the optimal. And we didn't have only subjects, uh, so on, only goalkeepers from Ajax. In this, in this study, we had goalkeepers also from outside of Ajax. And actually, one goalkeeper was coming from Barcelona back, 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 back then, from the first team of Barcelona, which is, which is now the first, the first goal, like, the goal uh, keeper at, at Ajax, Andre, Andre Onana. And also, uh, we had we had we had also uh, goalkeepers from other clubs uh, from from the first division in uh, Holland as, as well. So we didn't have only goalkeepers following the same training methodology, which was uh, which was nice to see that they 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 all met in this in this preferred preferred kind of uh, movement. So let's uh, let's see. What, uh, um, what we can further analyze with this that we cannot analyze with high-speed camera and with footage. We, we actually calculated the center of mass of the body and we projected it. And from, from there, uh, we calculated the linear, the linear momentum, uh, the horizontal and the vertical and the angular and the angular momentum. And what did we see? So what, what we are seeing in red is the horizontal momentum. Uh, we're seeing uh, the solid line is for high dive and dashed line is for low dive. And the blue line is for vertical momentum, the same thing, solid line, high dive, 
and dashed line is for low dive. And we're seeing clearly that the horizontal momentum was more crucial in the dive. So the goalkeepers needed to develop this uh, high horizontal momentum. And this, is, this was the first um, kind of, uh, <laughs> not clash, I don't want to say clash in the ideas. Let's, let's put it like this, clash in the ideas between us, the, the researcher, and between the coaching, the coaching team, like that they were focusing more on vertical jump in their training Whereas what we see here, the goalkeeper didn't need to jump vertically much, didn't need to generate this vertical, you know, vertical momentum. And uh, it was quite logical when, for, when, when, see, when, when seeing that, 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 that they had to cover more horizontal distance than, than, vertical, than vertical distance in the dive. So this was the first, the first result that we saw, that horizontal momentum was more important and more crucial in the dive than vertical one. The second one was the angle, the angle momentum, which was, of course, which was evident in both heights. So in, in high dive, which, which, are we, which we are seeing in red and low dive in blue. So it was evident in, in both dive, but it was more crucial in low dive, which was also um, uh, in a very logical here. And we didn't, we didn't, um, we didn't have a contradictory uh, uh, and ideas about it with the coaching team because of course they have to fall so they have to turn their their, their body as quick as possible um, to to low dives than than to high dives now what's important from this first study so we kind of analyzed the, the velocity of the center of mass towards the ball and kind of looked at the contralateral push off so the leg opposite to the movement that that the goalkeeper is diving towards and the epsilon push off. And of course, we could do this because we had the force space. So we, we, we could see how much forces are being generated by the legs, by, by, by each leg sep separately. And we had the kinematics. So we had the movement and we could see, okay, how much contribution from these uh, forces are being put uh, to, to the center of mass velocity, which, which basically reflect the whole, the whole body movements. And we're talking about the velocity towards the, the ball, of course. So what did we see? This first graph is the contribution to the vertical velocity, because of course we split our we, we split the velocity into a vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity, and we wanted to see how much contribution from each leg to the vertical one and to the horizontal one. So to the vertical one, uh, in this graph we're seeing contralateral leg in blue, ipsilateral leg in red. I would like to remind you, contralateral leg is the leg opposite to the side of the dive. Ipsilateral leg is the leg the same side of the dive. So in the diving safe, the contralateral leg will leave the ground first, and then the ipsilateral leg is the last leg that will push off basically and will leave the ground. So we're seeing clearly that, that that's that's the zero line here. We're seeing clearly that the contralateral leg, which is in blue, is contributing especially at the first. So what we're seeing this first vertical line. This is the contralateral peak force. The contralateral leg is performing the highest force at this point. And this is the peak force of the ipsilateral leg. So from the start of the dive, we're seeing that the contralateral leg is contributing way more than the ipsilateral leg. Why? Because the ipsilateral leg is busy just positioning, uh, the goalkeeper is busy positioning the ipsilateral leg in the perfect, in the perfect position for the next push off. So, and basically the, the only contribution is, is coming from the contralateral leg. And this, this contribution uh, lasted further in the dive, so lasted longer. And it was always greater than the contralateral leg. So that's for the vertical one. What, what about the horizontal one? The horizontal one, we saw also a clear significant difference. As well, as, as well between the contribution of the contralateral leg, which is still in blue, and the ipsilateral leg, which is still in red. And especially this, this difference was very pronounced at the beginning. So, so at, the, at the start of this development of uh, force, of this development of power. So what, what, what we can say to the coaches from from, from this. Well, we can say to the coaches, okay, focus on the contralateral leg. 
And the coaches would say, yeah, but the FC lateral leg is the last one that's leaving the ground. How, how we should focus more on the contralateral leg? And of course, in the next part of our discussion, we will deal with this most, more, most probably and most specifically. So yeah, so focus on the contralateral leg. It's more important than the FC lateral leg in pushing off, in developing this horizontal linear momentum and developing this vertical linear, this vertical linear momentum. At the same time, try to quit and reduce these uh, vertical jumps in your training, whether for strength and conditioning or for technical coaches, and focus on horizontal uh, uh, jumps and, hori and horizontal push-offs instead of vertical ones. So let's move now to the second study. In the second study, we had nine elite goalkeepers also performing their preferred technique, but what was significantly different than the, the first study that we had ball cannon here. So we, we didn't have balls hanging. Uh, so we tried more, okay, let's see if we can, what, what if we can see the same with, with having ball uh, cannon and let's see uh, a more realistic setup where the ball is coming from the, from, from the front. And we also have, we calibrated the ball cannon to shoot balls uh, right and left at 190, 30 centimeters, of course, plus or minus 10 centimeters off, off and on. And uh, yeah, and also we calibrated the speed of the, uh, the ball cannon to the speed that we saw in the first study, which is around 1.2 seconds. So we wanted the ball to reach the, the ball with around this point because we, don't even, we didn't want the goalkeeper to anticipate because he couldn't anticipate. We wanted the, the goalkeeper to react, to have time to react and then to dive as quick as possible. So here, what was uh, special, we dig deeper into the kinetics. When we talk to kinetics, it's like the reasons of these movements. So we're talking here about uh, joint powers, joint moments, and uh, joint angular velocity of the hip, knee, and ankle joints, which are the most, the most important in the push-off. So we calculated these three variables, joint angle velocity, joint moment, and joint, uh, and joint power. And when, when, when we say joint moment, is that the forces that, being, that, that are being generated by, by, by the muscles and transferred to the joints. What did we see? I'll try to simplify this, 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 this graph. I wanted to summarize it in one graph, but I will try to simplify it and let you focus on the most important thing. What, what, what we're seeing on the, in, the, in the first line, the first uh, line is the joint, pow joint power, second one, joint moment, third one, joint angular, joint angular velocity. In the first column, we're seeing the hip flexion extension. So the hip joint in the flexion extension. Uh, in the second column, the hip joint in the abduction abduction, so in the frontal plane. In the third column, uh, we're seeing the knee joint in the flexion extension. And the last, the, the, the last column, we're seeing the ankle joint in the plantar, uh, plantar dorsiflexion, so in the sagittal plane. So what did we see? If, if, if you notice, of, of course, the hip, hip joint, we notice directly that the hip joint uh, is creating uh, so, so it, like a big, large moment is being generated around the hip joint, especially in the extension, because the extension is the positive, the positive direction. The blue line is always contralateral leg. The red line is always the ipsilateral leg. So we're seeing this clearly in the hip joint. And we're seeing also this clearly in the uh, anchor, plantar, anchor plantar flexion. We're seeing this in the knee extension, but not as pronounced uh, in terms of value, in terms of magnitude, as the hip extension and the anchor plantar, the plantar flexion. So we have some, some uh, imbalance in the distribution and we have a preference so we have like one movement is being uh is is turning to be more important than the other in this triple extension movement whereas also in the hip abduction abduction where we thought okay we we would find there very interesting uh results well we didn't compared compared to the other because we thought that the the movement is mostly in the frontal plane so, uh, so, and we, th we thought that we would see lots of forces being generated in this plane, but we didn't, which was, which, which was, very, which was very interesting and uh, to, to, to our future, to our future results and conclusions. Uh, and in terms of joint power, the highest power 
was from the hip extension and at the same time from the ankle from the ankle plantar flexion. So uh, that's that's what I want you to focus at this this graph this graph this graph and this graph. And that's in terms of magnitude. That that's in terms of values. Now in terms of coordination, which one started before before the other? How how was the coordination? Well, we thought we saw a proximal to distal sequence between the hips. So the hip started first, then, then the knee, and then the ankle in both legs, in the contralateral and then the ipsilateral. The contralateral uh, finished, and then the ipsilateral started in terms of peak. So the contralateral hip started, uh, reached the peak first, peak power, of course, that's what, that's what we're talking about. And then the knee, and then the ankle, and then the ipsilateral hip knee and then ankle this was similar to what we see in olympic weightlifting movement in vertical jumps in uh high jump and long jump in track and field so this was similar in terms of the, this triple ex, uh, triple extension but what was special because in the, because the goalkeeper uh, the goalkeeper movement in terms of dive is special in terms of sequential push-offs. Right? So, so the, the goalkeeper movement is not simultaneous push-off. It's pushing off with one leg and then the other leg. Uh, we, saw, we saw actually the same pattern, proximal to distal, hip to knee, to, to ankle in uh, both legs. So what we can say to the coaches from these results? Well, um, we can say that hip extension and ankle plantar flexion are the most the most important movements to focus at in the gym and on the field, especially in the gym. And uh, maybe the hip extension is more important because it's starting the movement. This is what is starting the movement, and we saw this in the coordination. And uh, we said also to train the goalkeepers in power exercises where they have to generate this triple extension, hip extension, knee extension, plantar ankle. I can plant reflection sequentially, which is similar to the weightlifting exercises. And at the same time, focusing on the hip drive and involving this transfer, because the hip drive is the one that is starting the movement, involving this transfer uh, in the energy to the lower joints, knee and ankle, and leading to this uh, upper body reaching uh, movement that the goalkeeper should 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 always so the energy should um, should uh, be transferred in this in this manner. Now let's conclude with this, with the third study. And the third study, what was interesting is that okay, after looking at the preferred te technique of the goal of, of the goalkeeper, now let's try, try let's try to change some things in the starting position, where we see okay, this was interesting. To, to, to change from a bio, 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 biomechanical perspective. So seeing, okay, from a physical perspective, using the physics and applying the, the, laws, the, the, the laws of physics, okay, we can say this is better. So let's, let's try if practically is, is also better. So we changed stance width. Uh, we, uh, we imposed three different stance width, 50% uh, of leg length, 75% and 100%. And we also imposed three different angles, 45, 75, and 90 de degree knee, knee angle at the starting position. So what did we see? Interestingly, so of course, let me, let me uh, uh, start by explaining the PT1 and PT2, these, these abbreviations. So PT1 is preferred technique before imposing any changes. And then we impose the changes, which are stands with 75, 75%, SW100 is 100% and SW50 is 50%. And then also the, the, the knee angle, 45 degrees, 75 degrees, and 9 degrees. And then after imposing the changes, we have, in order to, to, to normalize our results and be able to have concrete results, we did, again, the preferred technique, which is PT2. So we did preferred technique before imposing changes and after imposing changes. What did we see? Clearly, stance with 75 was the fastest in terms of dive time. So goal, goal, goalkeepers dived in terms of movement. Of course, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking in terms of reaction time. I'm talking purely movement. We developed an algorithm to be able to split reaction time from movement time. 
and we're focusing just on movement time. We're focusing just on motor performance. And in terms of movement time, goalkeepers were uh, reached the ball faster when starting from stance width of 75% than when starting of their preferred stance width that was around 40, 35 to 40%. So this was the kind of very, very interesting. And this was the, 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 the goal of every researcher in any field to find something that to falsify all the training practices and try to bring something new to the table. So, okay. Then we, we said, we need to know why before, be, before telling the coaches, because the coaches won't, and won't, and won't believe us. So we need to know why, we need to understand why. And then we tell the coaches, this was faster and this is why. So we analyzed the displacement of the center of mass and the velocity of the center of mass towards, towards the ball. Of course, from the start until uh, the uh, fastest reach. What, what we saw, we're seeing clearly. So we, we are comparing PT1, PT2, and stands with 75. We, we don't care about the rest because the, the rest wasn't faster than uh, preferred te technique. So we are focusing on preferred technique and stands with 75 now only to, to, to highlight the changes. The green, the, uh, green lines are for stands with 75, red lines are for um, uh, preferred technique, the second one, and blue are for the first preferred technique. We're seeing clearly that at the contralateral push-off, this, this, this was the contralateral push-off, the moment where the contralateral leg is performing this high forces. The velocity of the center of mass in the sense of 75 started to shift from, from the rest. They all started equal and then at this moment it started to shift. So clearly at the contralateral push-off, at this moment, the goalkeeper is able to move his center of mass quicker than the usual preferred, preferred technique. And this difference was sustained almost until, until, until the end. So this was the main, the main um, difference between Sanskrit 75 and their preferred technique. And then we also wanted to explain this and we kind of explained it. This is what we are seeing. This is the stance width of the goalkeeper. Preferred technique is red for preferred technique one, blue for preferred technique two. Green is for stance width 75 and we're seeing the extreme stance width 100. So I want you to focus on the green, blue and red. Whatever is the starting position, the goalkeeper, we saw that the goalkeeper had to increase their stance width. And this is what Matt hi highlighted clearly in the, in the videos, that the goalkeeper did this double tap, basically to increase their stance width, not to decrease. They never decreased their stance width, uh, un unless it was for low dives, because they needed to fall and not to push off. And we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about this later. So the goalkeeper always needed to reach this around 90% stance width even if he started from his preferred stance width. So why, why losing time and increasing stance width? Whereas he can start from a nearby stance width and don't lose time and have more time to basically, and this was the, the, the time that he had more to generate forces. And this was what we saw earlier, more forces in the push pushup because he had more time to generate these, these forces. Of course, the forces, uh, the forces are generated before the movement. We, we saw in the previous figure that the, the velocity increased here because usually in physics, the forces uh, are done before what you see. So what, what, what we see is the velocity and the, and the movement. So what, what we can say to the coaches from, from this? We can say that focus on 75% stance width, of course, uh, normalized to the leg length in the gym and also on the field in both. So when you, when you are asking the goalkeeper to do this pre-jump to uh, prepare for, for the dive, let them focus on this 75% and implement it in strength and conditioning sessions as well as technical sessions. And of course, we followed up uh, these three experiments 
after understanding the movement better, we followed up these experiments with an intervention study that I'm currently almost done with the data analysis. And I can say that they are promising and hopefully you will see, you will see it soon and um, it's gonna be revealed soon. Uh, where we kind of created the optimal training protocol, strength and conditioning and technical, so in the gym and on the field. Um, and we implemented it for three months uh, uh, and we did pre-test and post-test. And we, uh, we, kind of, we, kind of, we are analyzing the changes in the motor performance, which is purely the dive time. And uh, yeah, and uh, hopefully soon you're gonna, you're gonna be seeing the, re the results. So these are these are the pickup points, um, the take-home messages uh, from from the three studies, and thank you for your interest. Okay, Ronnie, thanks a lot for that. That was uh, that was uh, fantastic. Um, obviously, and we'll certainly get into an aspect of the work that you're working on now in terms of taking that research into a training methodology in more detail with with Matt and Sebastiano uh, in a moment. But I just wanted to probably bring in Matt first and, and just to get your reaction to sort of maybe first the training method, the, the, the experiment methods themselves. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, that Matt, in terms of one taking information from a laboratory uh, kind of research situation as opposed to, to sort of learning directly from a game situation. Yeah, no, no, I think there, there's been some really great points made. I think there's there's pros and cons for both. I think the I've been flicking through some of the questions as well. There's been some really good questions, um, which will be interesting to come on to. But I think initially to get to get the research, it seems like some really good research. So naturally, you're going to do it in the in the, in the lab, if you like. Um, and, and, and like I said at the start, I think it's important that the concepts you're using outside are backed up by the research. So I think there's a time and a place for both really. I think once you, what I found really interesting was the, you know, when we talk about what works for the individual, if you're going off the 75% for their own length, I think that's that's really interesting for me because it, in effect, it's tailored for them, isn't it? Correct me if I'm wrong, Ronnie. So it's tailored for, for whatever their height is and you're feeling that's the optimum. So I, I found that really interesting. Um, now, you know, naturally you're not going to get a, I think there was another question about a realistic cues and triggers and, Obviously, uh, what I noticed, they were having a little hop as well on your on your map before they were doing the little double tap, which was good. Um, I think in answer to your question, I suppose, Steve, I think it's good to then bring that outside because then they're they're doing that from a from a person kicking the ball, so they're they're reading their you know when their head's going down, what their body shape's like, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think there's definitely a time and a place for both. Not to sit on the fence, but um, definitely a time and a place for both. And for Sebastiano, I mean, sort of looking at the, the research there as presented by, by Ronnie, what were, the, what were the things that stood out for you in terms of the, the methods of the research? No, I think it is, uh, it is fantastic to be able to see from that kinetic and kinematic perspective what is actually happening in the performance of a dive. I think that at the end of the day, it, it sort of um, confirms the eye, the technical eye. Of course, I've been very lucky to, to work alongside Tony Jimenez, who is fantastic at his job. And a lot of his work is, is through video analysis and reviewing what happens in, in the training sessions, what happens in the competition, of course. And through this analysis, he's got such a great insight that he will come up and, and straight away and understand when the width needs to be wider, when the push-ups are not in the correct position. Or So all of this, I think, is kind of confirmed as well by by the uh, research that Ronnie has produced. Of course, like when we look at different moments at which both legs are pushing off or the contribution of a contralateral uh, foot on that first study being uh, major compared to the, to the closest leg, specifically when we're looking at those high dives. So I think that it really guides us towards uh, implementing good strength and conditioning drills in the gym. For instance, some of the things that we've been working on together as well was already trying to create uh, that that uh, resistance from a lateral perspective and, and focusing as well on, on pushing off more from that furthest leg to the movement than, than the closest one. So I think it is fantastic to be able to see this all this information come together and uh, and to really guide us towards uh, good good designing and good uh, prescription of the training. Yeah, um, just before bring Ronnie back in, sort of with with Matt um, in terms of the findings, Matt, was there anything there that 
that stood out for you that did something that you was, was unexpected or did they kind of reinforce what you'd been seeing with the eye of what you've been working on at Birmingham anyway? Yeah, I think it was more of a, a reinforcement, but a, a really positive one because, um, like I said, the the seventy five percent is like you know everyone is really individual and different, and I think you need to to be able to understand that first and foremost as a coach. But I think what's really great about this as well is just shows how, similar just to echo what Sebastiano said there. It's so important that we're linked with the S and C departments at the club, and and again, there's like a holistic approach to it really because I don't think we can be working in isolation. Um, again, because the, you know, the, if the research is suggesting something, then obviously you want to be, you want to be doing it. One one question I would like to ask, Ronnie, you, you did mention about the, you know, the the step where the, the sweep. So obviously, you naturally jump into the wider starts to push off, unless, like you said, you're not going to, um, you're going for the lower ones and you're not having to go too far. Have you done any studies on bringing that foot in, and if there's any good and bad traits from it, if that makes sense? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and the, I, I basically wrote wrote down also uh, two uh, points that I, I I wanted to answer as, as well from from the videos and from the questions that you you raised in your videos. Uh, so let me let me start now with your question, and then I I, I will tap on the second one. Uh, yeah. So what what I saw in the video, and you wanted uh, um, you were basically asking. Is this is this optimal? Basically, he didn't save it. He, he didn't save the ball in two in two in two in two occasions. We we, we saw two different goalkeepers sweeping this uh, ipsilateral leg mm. inwards, and they were diving, but they were not. But they were not saving the ball. Uh, they were they were not successful. Now, now, now of, of course, um, we can argue that many factors plays plays a role, like reaction time, uh, the position compared to the vision. Etc. And also motor and motor performance. So how 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 quick was the movement? And uh, and what I saw that it, that, that was clear that this sweeping, this swinging of the Seattle leg is very is very important to create the large angular momentum needed in low dive. So th this is th this is very important because you need to create very large angular momentum is in very short short time. However. Uh, most goal, goal, goalkeepers, and from, from my experience, practically are not very well familiar in really focusing on only pushing off with the contralateral leg. So if you sweep this ipsilateral leg, you, you, you cannot use it much any, any, anymore. You use it as a, as a support. So if you're not really used and trained to push off very well with the contralateral leg, if the ball is far from you and you're diving for it, it's going to be very hard to save it because you cannot propel, you cannot generate the large horizontal momentum. Also, because you're not trained to generate this large horizontal momentum, you're trained in the gym to generate vertical momentum with vertical jumps and, and all this. So when these are combined, you are able, swinging this epsilateral leg will let you create this very large angular momentum very quickly and being able to plant this contralateral leg and push off with it uh, powerfully, you'll, you will be able to move your body horizontally powerful enough and fast and fast enough to reach this, this ball. And I think this is this is the missing link, the push off. And be, 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 because if you play back the videos, you will see that they, they, they weren't pushing off; they were just falling. And uh, they were trying to push off. Actually, what I saw, they were trying to push off with the ipsilateral leg, but mm -hmm. the ipsilateral leg you cannot push off with it. The day when they were trying, the ipsilateral leg was slipping because it's not in the optimal position to push off anymore. If you don't use the contralateral leg, then you're doomed. I couldn't side into this as well, uh, uh, Ronnie, because uh, usually many training programs as well will focus on that development of strength on the vertical plane or from a bilateral stance. And I think that this is fundamental to understand. We can work laterally, but we don't have to always work as well bilaterally, you can work unilaterally. So, so the force production and, and focusing on producing power in a unilateral stance, and again, doing it against the sense of the body from that contralateral leg. But on those times when you actually sweep the leg, you still have the other one on the floor being able to produce that force and impulse you, then into then reaching onto the ball. Very more stability at your hands as well. In case of catching, you have better transference all the way through as well. Okay.
Okay, no, I don't know that. Yeah, Ronnie, whether you wanted to uh, come back, come back on that, or yeah, I just wanted to highlight the second point that that also Matt uh, highlighted clearly in the videos. Uh, the, the second point, which was actually the first point that you highlighted, <laughs> which which was the double tap. The double yeah. tap is, is very interesting here to link the research that I'm trying to isolate the movement. And also, when, when we talk about the starting position, are we talking about the starting position before the double tap or after the uh, after double tap? This is, this is very important. And it's clearly uh, the starting position that we're talking about is after the double tap. Because in our research, we were asking the goalkeeper to move as quick as possible. So after the stance width, he cannot double tap. If he double tap, he will lose, he will lose time. So he just needs to directly push off. So we are talking about the, let's not call it starting starting position because we have to call it like, like, like this to be, uh, to be uh, uh, meaningful for readers from, from outside of the, the football uh, world. But we can call it the athletic position that Sebastiano called it, called it, called it previously. This like the, the, the most optimal position. Okay, now I will put myself in the most optimal position and I will start. This is what we are training. This is the starting position that we are talking about. This 75 75% leg length. Like at this time, it should be 75% leg length, not, not, not before. So after, after, the, after the double tap, and this is what we were focusing in this intervention study now that I'm analyzing the data of it. Uh, on the field, this was the most important point. So basically uh, we, had, we had the, goal, the goalkeepers set themselves from a shoulder width, stance width, or from moving directly to a 75% leg length and then diving. So we let them get used to this 75% leg length after the double tap. So double tap into a 75% leg length always. And of course, every goalkeeper will get used to his 75%. And then uh, with, 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 with training, and the sooner you start this training, the better it, it is. Because, we, because of, of, of course, we know we're trying to change something that the goalkeepers have been doing for, for a long time. So, so it's going to be hard, especially the older the goalkeeper, the tougher it is. So, yeah. In terms of any training methods, we sort of bring it then with, with, with Matt and we're sort of working with young goalkeepers and you're, you're, allowing, you're allowing those young goalkeepers then to organize themselves. They'll have their own techniques. Obviously, mm -hmm. some of them will have some of those techniques that you've just shown, a double tap or the side shuffle. Some will maybe, they'll have their goalkeeping heroes or maybe sort of the ones that have more of a shuffle step like Hugo Lloris, you sort of at that stage, do you kind of allow them to adapt whichever style they want and then work with them? Or are you looking specifically, okay, this is what I see as being an optimum and, and begin that way? Yeah, no, I think Sebastiano made a great point that, that I agree, you just, you know, I let them and we let them figure it out for themselves. Again, I think if you're if your training environment's right, so they're, 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 you know, they're seeing, so if you talk about a training session, I don't know, they'd say they've, I don't know, had hundred shots at them. Hopefully there have been a hundred realistic cues and triggers. So they're, they're teaching themselves really. And obviously you're there to give a bit of guidance. And I think the skill of the coach, obviously if there's something fundamentally wrong and, and you've highlighted it, then, then obviously you might step in. Uh, but again, I think you've got to do that from a, a place of knowledge and, and you understand the concepts. So I think things like this are really good for people watching that if they are going to go in and say, oh, you must do this, you must do that. But I think it's the way you say it and the way you deliver it. So it's just, you know, I, I've done it recently. Maybe have a look at this, uh, talking about the double double tap. And um, it's worked, really. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying we've, we've um, you know, we've cracked it and we, we've... Uh, you know, he's completed it and he's great, but there's been a goalkeeper at the club where we've, we've dropped in the idea of the double tap and just trying to get him set in a little bit later. So he's slightly in the air and then just working on his stance and, and how he's pushing off into things. I think also what I noticed as well, where, where you were giving this info to them, it really engaged their brain as well because they were focusing on it, which I think is quite good. Whereas kids at times just do things because they do it. So yeah, it's a really broad, it's an interesting thing really, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely more, you know, let them do it, guide them, rather than prescribe it too much. Um, I think that's really important for me. You've got to allow them to make decisions. Yeah, Sebastiano, when, see, at, at that sort of age, as, as, they're, as they're developing, as, as Matt says, you sort of allow them to sort of find 
organize themselves. You're giving them external cues, which allows them to, to sort of focus that way. But then with what Ronnie has shown that you're looking at very specific sort of ratios in terms of the stance width. So then you're sort of having to beginning to internalize. I mean, how do you approach that from a physical perspective? You're trying to relearn those movements to be that kind of specific, or is it one of those that you kind of let go unless there is a very severe problem? If, you know, we I think we always believe that there is room for improvement, no matter what the level of the goalkeeper is and, or any football player. And of course, all the information from a technical point of view that is given from the goalkeeper coach or, or the manager definitely is taken on board and it can be applied then into the gym or into smaller drills that happen on, on the field of play. And definitely something that I think I mentioned before is, is trying to improve their predisposition to then perform in those actions. And a lot of the time what we spend uh, on, on working on in the gym is to create that habit to then, for example, observe a situation where necessary Really, you know, in that athletic stance, in that in that width stance that allows you to dive uh, optimally, but you need to be able to understand the game, be connected with what's happened, with what's happening, and when the situation then develops into a potential diving action, then we need to try to find correctly what that stance is, and we work on that automatization of, of finding that charge in that position. Then the action can develop into a dive, or like I said before. They might need to still adjust laterally that position or come back into observing the game in the, in the posture that they were before. So I think that we have a great incidence in the sense that we uh, put them into many different contexts and situations of the game from different angles, as I said, in, from between the ball and the goal, because it is not the same to uh, observe a ball that is uh, close to the corner compared to a ball that is in the front of the, the edge of the box and, uh, and how the movement patterns will then develop or the position of the goal, of course. Uh, they can be almost in, in perpendic perpendicular position to the goal when, when the ball is going to come from the side, from across, etc. And they can be completely frontal when, when the player is running with the ball and getting to the edge of the box. So we start to work on what is the best place position in all those positions. We start to look at what are the feet pattern and the movement patterns that would be the best choice for them in order to maintain a good position and, and be able to find that charge, that last second um, stance that allows them to then create a good reaction and, and, and perform that dive. Okay, fantastic. Um, there's a lot of questions around the, the training method, so we'll try and start getting through as many of those as we can. Uh, there's one here specifically for, for, for Dr. Ronnie uh, from Harold Grant Miranda. Um, so Dr. Ronnie, in order to train the horizontal diving save momentum, how would we administer this training session, especially in the gym? Yeah, um, it's a very, it's a very good, it's a very good question. And this was one of the, like, not challenges. I don't want to say it's challenges, but uh, yeah, but in, uh, things that we had to think about uh, in so much when trying to create the optimal training protocol, because we had to focus on this and we had to be creative uh, because we don't have many uh, if you if we think about it we don't have many equipments in the gym uh, in terms of machines in terms of um, in equipments no, no matter what sort of equipments we have in order to generate this uh, horizontal uh, hip extension knee extension ankle plantar flexion because we want this horizontal hip extension knee extension uh, ankle plantar flexion so we are used to uh, training this triple extension in the sagittal plane, so basically vertical plane, so, uh, so vertically and not horizontally. So uh, one, of, one of the most, most important exercises are the sled pull, uh, and especially this, uh, like in terms of strength, because of course, when, when you wanna talk about strength and conditioning, you want to uh, split it into strength training and power training, let's, let's just say. And in terms of strength training, it was the uh, side sled pull. So by attaching a belt onto the waist and then pulling uh, the sled sideways. And then of course you need to use this contralateral leg to uh, in the pull it. And in terms of power, uh, in terms of power exercise, it was the speed skating jumps, which is uh, an exercise uh, uh, taken from speed skating training, which are the Dutch are, are also great, great in it. 
and uh, basically it's a lateral jump using only your contralateral leg and without using your ipsilateral. So your ipsilateral leg is just in the air for, for balance and performing this contralateral jump uh, and landing on your, on your ipsilateral leg. Okay, brilliant. Um, sort of a question from Sean Byrne, sort of said it's for both Sebastiano and Matt, but I'll, I'll, let, Matt, I'll let Matt jump in first. Um, so Matt, when, when training to improve the speed of actions, either for contact speed or pushing force, are there any particular cues you prefer to use during training? And do you find internal or external cueing is more effective? From my perspective, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely say more so external is, is something I'm, I'm really interested in. So like I've said before, the the environment and kicking kicking the you know for me you know I've been at clubs where and I won't name names where there's been a goalkeeper that's played you know hundreds and hundreds of games real top level um, so it was a Premier League club at the time I think he was about 39 at the time and um, I remember watching him in a shooting drill with with some um, let's just say some some big names some really capable strikers uh, and he saved he saved an awful lot um, and I remember thinking you know is that just because he's a you know a great goalkeeper obviously physically he was he was um he was coming towards the end of his career let's just say but for me it was a lot of anticipation and just reading the the, the cues and the triggers now don't you know don't get it confused i'm not saying it's a guess for me it's a, it's it's just a subconscious reading of something i think we all do it i've certainly done it um so i think the more you can get goalkeepers in environments where they're just reading you know how someone strikes a ball and knowing your players, you know, I'm quite big at the moment on telling the goalkeepers to really look at the detail on the ball, not just from a shooting perspective, but from, it could be, you know, defending the the space of being on the front foot, you know, naturally, I'm digressing a little bit, but naturally, as soon as the transition of the ball is, is changed, they, they always retreat back to their goal. But we're saying, well, really look at the detail on the ball. You know, it, are they opposed? Do you need to drop? So... I'm trying to really get the goalkeepers, yeah, <clears throat> not to keep repeating it, just to really, you know, look at the ball in the detail and, and what is that now providing? Uh, so an image for your brain, what is it telling you? So I think the more external, the better for me. Uh, yes, Sebastian, I'll first let you sort of jump in on terms of internal versus external. Um, and then I have a, a follow-up question for you as well. Yeah, I think there is a combination of both, particularly when we work in the gym, because uh, we can break it down into different segments and, and body parts. So, of course, you need to sometimes be given internal cues to try to focus more on what happens within the body. But equally, as we try to integrate those those drills and make it more similar to, to the competitive action of diving, external cueing is, becomes more important because we start to look more about what happens around us. We try and keep a good predisposition to to realize those actions. So then definitely I would use a combination of both, but probably start more through internal cues and then follow up and integrate more external cues as we go through the progression. Uh, yeah, so, and it's an interesting question here from Martin Sander. I think he's sort of picking up on what Ronnie sort of said in his presentation in terms of the, the sequence of the movement being very similar to those used in, in other sports. And specifically mm -hmm. um, he picks up on like light weight lifters. We've got first the hip movement, knee, then ankle. So any sort of question is, is then can I let a keeper do a weightlifting exercise on the pitch mm -hmm. and then right afterwards do an exercise on the field where the same muscles will be used? Is then effective? Do you see that as being, yeah, integrating that, those sort of different exercises and then sort of in, bringing them straight into a Yeah, I might, I might be a controversial here on the answer, but if they can use them, you can. But I would say, or uh, of course, the very technical drills, particularly the Olympic weightlifting type of type of drills, uh, might be complicated. And the other thing that I might disagree with is, is the use of the hands, because it is necessary to to link the weight to the shoulders, and, and, and you need to grip them with your hands. And uh, I think that one of the most fundamental things to to teach or, or to work on the optimization of the dice is that we need to have free hands. So I think I'm more in line with the type of drills that uh, Ronnie was explaining before, like a sled pull or. Uh, perhaps not sleds, but other type of uh, links or, or anchors that we can use with resistance. So we can uh, basically load that center of mass directly to the hips using straps, uh, using different anchors on the body, then allow us to be moving more freely 
and be able to use our hands at the same time as it links up through the whole power production of the dive. And then equally, we need them to do a contact with the ball at the end of it. So I would personally choose uh, to implement other type of drills, but equally I understand the transference of uh, some of these uh, weightlifting exercises towards the, uh, towards the um, achievement of producing force on that triple extension. But of course, we need to also remember that they're bilateral exercises, that they require a lot of technical work. And uh, perhaps uh, I would not choose to implement them in my, in my program. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Ronnie, I don't know if you had anything to, to add on, on, on that specific point in terms of sort of bringing in sort of exercises from other sports. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Sebastiano and, um, and, and yes, I would, like, I would like just to add one thing because uh, when, when, when we think about the optimal stance width of 75%, um, I, would, in, I would like, because sometimes in, uh, uh, so, so you need this double stance sometimes to train this. And uh, I would like to see this in, in of, of, of course, um, please, but be, because of course, when we are discussing these things, some people can get you wrong, but uh, I'm not saying focusing only on this, but, uh, but the training program should, should really involve these, for example, squats, deadlift from this stance with, from, from this, like in even, even, even if it's a, if it's a bilateral move, if, if, even if, if you are loading, um, uh, you are loading the arms maybe, but you can all you can always transfer it to, to, to the uh, optimal movement that you are uh, aiming for pre-season. Of course, here we're talking maybe more uh, off-season. We're talking more about the preparation, the fundamentals. Uh, working on your squats, working on your uh, work, working on your uh, lifts, Olympic lifts, uh, especially like you know, I, I, I would say clearly that the snatch and the jerk would help here because you get this also um, overhead reaching uh, movement that you want at the end of the uh, at the end of the triple extension. So, uh, but of, but of, of course. You, you are not satisfied with this and you cannot get satisfied with this. And you, you, you cannot focus on this closer, closer, closer to the season because closer to the season, you want, uh, you want to try to replicate uh, the, the most specific movement that you want to train. And then you want to move towards more applied, more specific and uh, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um... One here then for, for Matt uh, from Bruno Sante, Santos. Um, do you believe there exists a perfect technique for the various movements of the goalkeeper? I know you're kind of very keen to allow young goalkeepers to develop their own sort of style and technique, but is there, would you say there is a, is a perfect technique? Uh, no, I, personally, I, well, I don't think so. I don't, I think... Your job is your job. So if you can do it with you know a certain way, so some good goalkeepers have their hands low and and wide. Some I'm working with a goalkeeper now that's very rigid and has them up near his waist. So as an example, there both works uh, for them in their own right in their own way. So yeah, in short, no, I don't think there is me personally a really short answer to. There. So there, um, what is it you're sort of judging them on? It's basically just getting the job done and and then optimizing that that technique as, as much as possible yeah i think naturally you're going to look at the end result i think if it's something that seems to work for them but you could maybe improve so if it's a strength but can you make it like a super strength you do that or if it's something that you feel like they'd be better suited at doing it a different way you, you maybe just have that conversation but i just think yeah you've got to be mindful of your audience and who you're working with and what what they're doing and how it's going really so yeah again i just think it's if it's working you know it must be it's perfect for them isn't it so um yeah it's, i suppose it's more the end result and and, and the the um what's happening yeah okay um, sebastian i want to again I'm sort of a, a sort of follow up on the on the technique i think it's sort of a sort of question on on the double tap mm -hmm. um uh what your what your thoughts were 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 on that to give the goalkeeper extra spring, but if he doesn't get it down in the correct time, the timing, 
reduces that reaction time. I think he uses that example of um, Adrian in the Liverpool versus Atletico Madrid, mm-hmm. which I think might be harsh. It was very, seemed a very pronounced jump step, I think, if I remember rightly, from, from the goal he conceded. But he also slipped. So I think there's, there's two sides to that. But uh, just in terms of the, the extra spring you might get from from the, the double tap, what are your thoughts on that, Sebastiano? No, of course, uh, I think it's an, an inherent part of the performance of the dive. I think it, be, it belongs to that technique of that action, of that movement. So again, if we're trying to improve that action, then we, we need to look at that specifically. I think it is important. Of course, you can implement it in several drills. You can do it with different types of loading. Uh, and, and again, like it is simple to recreate, in my opinion. Of course, the technical action, I think that's something that is that has been fantastic at Spurs, is that since I've been working so closely with the goalkeeper coach, he was always present in the gym sessions and, and the sessions that used to happen 20 minutes before every, every training session, uh, in which we do a short warm-up on the gym, and uh, he will provide a lot of technical in, uh, input. So perhaps I would design some drills that aim to develop those uh, physical capabilities and, and to develop that motor control. But equally, he would come in and he would as well uh, provide his insight, uh, do all the little tweaks in terms of, as you say, the timing, the width of the feed, etc. So working closely definitely had a positive impact on, on the development of that performance. Then, Ronnie, um, again, on the, on the stance width and, and again with a focus on, on the double tap, uh, Martin Sander is asking, um, with that stance width of, of 75%, thinks that's quite wide. Um, only for the double tap, does it depends on distance of the striker and the speed of the ball? Shots close cannot be good with 75% of width in terms of that reaction time. Yeah, uh, 75% when we think about it, of course, and when, when, we, when we want to compare it to shoulder width or hip width, what, what, what we also, what we always preach, uh, shoulder width, hip width, this is, this is the optimal stay, the stay there is, is, is wide, is definitely wide. But however, if you remember the, uh, the graph, the last graph where I'm showing how is the stance width evolving, even when they are, start, when they are starting from 30, 40%, they needed to increase this stance width. They need it. Why? Because they don't want to jump high. If, if a goalkeeper will raise his, his, his hand, he can, he can reach the high post. So, so he doesn't need to jump high. So he doesn't need this shoulder width stance. He, he wants a wider stance in order to put this contralateral leg, because the contralateral leg is what is important. So let's talk about it. To put it to put the orientation of the contralateral leg more towards the goal. Because if the contralateral leg is, is oriented towards the ball, then the forces generated are going to be transferred to the center of mass better. And you can benefit from almost all the forces that you are generating. If your leg is more vertical, then you're going to lose lots of force. So you're going to be, in, even if you can generate high, high forces, you're going to use lots of force. Now, in, in terms of starting before, before the double tap, what is the stance width? After the double tap, what is, what is the stance width? Uh, you know, I think that the, the dive is a movement that is restricted by time. So it's, it's not a vertical jump or it's not a long, long jump where you can have, you, you can plan it well and you have more time, you, you, you have lots of time to plan it and to start with it and to do ev- everything that you can increase the performance. So here you are restricted in terms of time. And sometimes maybe you don't have time for this double tap. So in this, in, in this situation, it's better if you are already in a wide stance with closer, as close as possible to the 75%. Because if you are not, you're gonna lose lots of time already. You're, you're gonna use lots of time to increase this stance width. And if you don't increase this stance width, you cannot generate linear horizontal, horizontal momentum. So, so in, in both cases, you will not reach this ball unless the ball is right next to you, of course. Uh, and on that, there's just a couple of questions just to clarify what we're saying by 75% st- st- stance width. Um, Subagato Roy is asking, is it 75% of the leg length? 
or is it 75% of shoulder width or what, what are we talking no, about? Yeah, I, I mentioned clearly that it's 75% of the leg length and measured from the greater, from the greater trochanter, the, the head of the femur bone, the thigh bone, and to the uh, lateral malleoli, the, the ankle. Okay, fantastic. Um, Sebastiano, um, question here. Um, how much diving power comes from the arms? Well, <laughs> the funny one, I think that the research from, from Ronnie was very interesting to answer that question because, uh, of course, the one point of pressure that we have on the body is, is the feet. So um, I haven't quite looked at it, to be honest, in all honesty. I don't know how much of an impact or I don't specifically train one movement to produce more power, but we do know that. Of course, from model jumping analysis, we know that a counter movement jump with and without arms, uh, we have an impact on, on the total height of, of the jump. So I think that, of course, because the hand is so important on, on the position uh, from a technical perspective and, and they need to reach out and again, have that strength and that, um, um, that stability and the impact with the ball in order to take it away or to block it. I think that perhaps we don't probably look at it so much in terms of that power generation. But I think that is something very interesting, maybe to look into that hand positioning, how then when we lower our center of gravity and we get ready into that uh, uh, necessary stance with before we, we produce the dive, to look at how the shoulder complex and, and the arms can uh, add some of that momentum down and uh, perhaps uh, also increase the, the energy, the energy um, absorbed from, you know, at the ankles, at the knees, at the hips, before they actually produce the force. So definitely maybe something to look at, but perhaps we've been always too, uh, putting more focus on, on the technical aspect of the movement of the arms and the hands rather than, than in the power production of them. Yeah, and, and along those lines, uh, Matt, um, sort of already mentioned, sort of keepers you're working with, you'll have their hands in different positions, but for you, where are you sort of getting that balance in terms of keepers being able to move their hands quickly to the direction of the ball and how they may be sort of using their hands as part of that movement of the body. I don't think I have an answer really. I think it's more work in progress. I'm with um, Sebastiano there. It's an interesting concept in terms of, you know, as we're talking about this subject, how this then fits into what is the optimum, you know, you know, will we ever find utopia? I don't know. Will we ever find the, complete answer I don't know but it's definitely an interesting um, aspect I think as a coach I'm very open-minded anyway so I think again not to just say the same stuff if something's working for a goalkeeper then you know then it's working for them so like I said I'm, I'm working with if you look at like David De Gea for example his hands are and kept by the hands are really low big swing and you get a lot of people saying they can't do this they can't do that rightly or wrongly, but like I said, I'm working with a goalkeeper at the moment. This is very rigid, very, very like hip uh, around your hips, elbows quite tight, but it works for him. Um, and he's had a good career. So a very good career so far. So yeah, I think each to their own. Um, I don't think, who, you know, who am I to say, put your hands here? It's not me trying to keep the ball out of the net. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, I can add, please, to, to yes, this. Because, because this, is very, this is a very interesting topic because actually I'm planning for, I already planned for, um, for this research for next year. Uh, and we collected data. We, are, we already have, uh, have data. And, um, and we're, we are trying to find the contribution of the arm movements um, to the center of mass velocity. Which, 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 what we did with the, um, with the contralateral and the ipsilateral leg, exactly. And, um, and of course, if we try to translate from the vertical jump, and vertical jump is, is around 30%, more or less, in the contribution of, of the arms, maybe. And, uh, and basically, uh, the goal is after finding these, uh, the, the amount of contribution in the dive, then uh, yeah, then we're gonna also see what what we can impose there, and uh, uh, and change it and see and see see the impact. So hopefully, within a year, we should also have results in terms of this. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Sebastiano, we'll sort of try and get through our last couple of questions here. We're sort of cracking on with time, as I see. Um, so, Sebastiano, would video analysis of the goalkeeper's movement and showing it to the goalkeepers, does that aid in improving their diving predisposition? Yeah, of course. It's a massive part of the understanding because at the end of the day, like we said before, it's a technical action. So they need to be able to, to see themselves performing the action. And again, when we try to uh, tweak or change any aspect of their predisposition, of their stance, of the footwork, of the patterns that they move in, etc., it is uh, fundamental to then, uh, first of all, how do we see that? First, we do it through video analysis. That's the reality because as much as the eye can find from observing the training session, uh, having the ability to film all the training sessions, all the contents in the gym and every competitive game, where it gives us a lot of information, a lot of visual uh, understanding of that movement to then ourselves make the decisions and, and the analysis correctly. And then afterwards, from that point of view, we can choose how to, how to change, how to tweak. Uh, like uh, Man was saying, you need to also communicate it effectively, propose it with uh, the correct training methods and, and get that buy-in straight away. From, from the suggestions that we're doing all together. And then finally, if there is a response or if there is a, a, a change in that technique, it's important to then, again, reanalyze it, and view it, trim it, show it, and be able to make sure that whatever the changes have been, if they have a positive impact or if they have a negative impact, uh, to be able to then go track back and, and, and change it all together or to continue and, and be encouraged to, to continue to work in the way that we've been um, we've been proposing. Okay, fantastic. Um, Matt, the question I think this one is, is, is for you. Uh, when working with youth developing goalkeepers, how much time would you allocate to developing diving technique? Or would you prioritize other components before you started to focus on this? Is there a specific age or stage in development that you would start to give this more prioritization? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, you was stuttering a bit. Can you hear me quite clearly now? Is that okay? I think yes, I had a bit of a yeah, you're perfect. So. Cool. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I've actually done a, a recent, well, not a recent, during the lockdown, one of many webinars, like everyone, I'm sure. Uh, I jumped on and we had a chat about certain things. And, and one of them was, you know, the technical aspect. So uh, predominantly, so for example, if I was to frame a session, normally you'd have like your activation or warm-up game. Uh, linked to your syllabus um, then you'd most probably go into maybe a more isolated technical bit just to again this is uh, not not saying everyone does this like a technical bit so that'll be your second part and then you'd go into your three and four which would be your your game-based um, sort of uh, higher intensity bits so the, the question posed was you know why are we working in isolate so one of the one of the reasons to give you an idea is the the warm-up and activation if you were to, to number it one to five five being the highest in terms of physical or even cognitive you know um how high intensity was it and how uh demanding was it it would be a five but then you go into your technical bit and if you're stripping it right back and you you know you're teaching them how to dive you're then going back down to what one two in terms of the level and then you have to go back up to to through parts three and four and then with the team part five so the question i posed was why do we go back why do we go um why do we reduce it and i think it goes back to if the individual needs it then fine so if he's really struggling with it and he needs it in isolation for me fine but i the way i sort of work now is i almost try and uh, teach the technique through the session design so for example i don't know to give you an example if we were talking about playing around the pitch and what technique you'd need to use. So inside of your foot, rather than me saying, or me rolling the ball in and saying, this is the part of the foot I want you to use and me telling it to them, could my pitch dimensions encourage it? So could it be a, a long linear pitch with a, an obstruction in the middle that they had to play it down the channel? And it was almost forcing them to use that technique, if that makes sense. So, so my question to them would, could you do anything that's going to force them to to bring out a technique rather than telling it because then you've got the goalkeeper having the decision making which i think is powerful uh, hopefully that sort of makes sense but um whoever did answer the question if they want to reach out and i can can show them what i mean um more than happy to to explain further 
now. That's a question from Sean Burns. So yeah, Sean, there's an open invitation there for you to, to reach out to Matt. Um, I have one last question then for us directed for Ronnie um, from Rajat Guha. Uh, and we're back on the, the topic of the, of the wide stance. Do you prefer the wide stance if the goalkeeper is having average height or below average height? Average height in terms of morphology, I think um, I think it's 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 very well taken into consideration when we normalize it to the height of the goalkeeper. Of course, the leg length uh, basically reflects the uh, height of the goalkeeper, and uh, yeah, and I and I and I believe um, and I believe this should be because because in our study we had this like uh, goalkeepers above the average height, below the average height. We had also youth. So, and of course, uh, before, be, be, before some experiments, we had, we had some pilot studies and the pilot studies were, were, were done also on the youth, on the young team. And, uh, and of course, we're talking here about below the average height, if we're, if we're talking the optimal height for, uh, uh, for a team A goal, goal keeper. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's very well taken into consideration when you normalize uh, the stance width to the leg length. Perfect. Thanks a lot for making that clear, Roddy. And thanks a lot for your involvement today. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Matt and Sebastian. It was I also have sort of send out my thanks and appreciation to Sebastiano Pochettino. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here and uh, to share some space with, with you, Ronnie, with Matt. I think we've all enjoyed our time today. And um, finally, a, a big thank you to, to Matt Doyle. No, likewise. Appreciate your time, everyone. It's been really interesting. Um, be good to catch up again about it all. Sounds really interesting. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining us today for your, for your questions and making this a fantastic Sunday session. We we'll hope to see you all in the same time, same place next week.